Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of ARC's For Your Innovation podcast. Today, we have an exciting episode with Teddy Otomo, president at Bukalapak, a really interesting Indonesian e-commerce platform that we're going to learn about today. On this podcast, we also have Nick Roos, um, analyst at ARC, covering uh, e-commerce, gaming, um, partly crypto, and myself, Max Friedrich, I cover fintech at ARC. So, with that background, I think it's going to be an, an interesting conversation spanning e-commerce and offline um, and, and online e-commerce and fintech. And we're looking forward to learn uh, from Teddy about Mukalapak um, and, and the Indonesian, Indonesian e-commerce market. So with that, um, let's dive right into it. Teddy, um, thank you for joining. It'd be great if you could give us kind of your background um, and what led you to, to the role of president at Bukala Park and what, what you do there? Hi, yeah, thanks, Max. And hi, Nick. Um, great pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm the president of the company. I, I actually went through a number of different career, if I can say. It. Um, I was actually, uh, my PhD was actually in economics and I was a lecturer at Sydney University um, for quite some time. Uh, and then I moved to uh, Credit Suisse in the in the um, as an equity analyst uh, before I moved to a buy side in Schroders. And at about four years ago now, I was approached by one of the shareholder of Bukalapak because um, the shareholder is somebody that uh, I've known since 2001, and that's how I come about and introduce and, and got to know all the, uh, the the founders, the current. Uh, CEO, which back then was a COO. Mostly my role here, I oversee the corporate finance, um, but also on top of that, I oversee the government relation, the PR, uh, public relation. I also handle operational uh, tribe, we call it, i.e. investment solution, where we enable for uh, individuals in the nation uh, to invest in digital gold and also mutual fund in the Indonesian asset management. Uh, and on top of that, the uh, customer service, believe it or not, is also under me. So it does vary quite a bit in regards to our role. But in the sea level, we do have the tendency from time to time at a pond needs to to sort around a bit, uh, depending on on the dynamics and the agility that required from the company. Got it. Yeah, I think we're going to dive into kind of all these areas as we uh, get into the podcast. I think maybe to set things up, um, if you could tell our listeners um, about the the country Indonesia and and maybe a little bit of its kind of more recent history when it comes to digitization and you know I think some areas where probably uh, Bukalapak over the last ten years had you know had had an effect on an influence on kind of transforming the the country and maybe you know other other companies as well that we can touch on. But kind of what was the, the starting line in Indonesia? Kind of what do we have to know about the country? Sure. Um, the country is a very interesting one. As you would know, it's one of the most populous country in the world. It has about 270 million population. Now, it's an archipelago. So depending on high tide or low tide, roughly there are 17,000 islands. Uh, although in general, uh, the majority, the big islands, there are five of them. Now, this makes it quite interesting for the structure even of the e-commerce because um, in Indonesia, while it's 270 million population, the majority of the population actually do not live in the tier one city. 
define tier one city being the, the top five largest city of Indonesia, being the Jakarta, Surabaya, Bandung, Medan, Semarang. So on average, over 200 million of the population live outside this tier one city. The country has low single digit um, credit card penetration and relatively lower financial inclusion. And that's why uh, we started in 2010 as you know, a cookie cutter, so to speak, you can call it now as a cookie cutters um, e-commerce, practically copying anything coming out of uh, Taobao from China at that time. But at about four years ago, we starting to realize these this facts that if we are to address and to penetrate and tap into Indonesia, it's not like a lot of the other developed country where we model the e-commerce marketplace from. It's not a country where you can roll out to tackle into you know, the whole majority population of Indonesia um, using the cookie cutter strategy because you need to have offline presence. So as a result of that, starting four years ago, we started to tap into the traditional convenience store. Today, we have 13 million uh, mom and pop kiosk traditional convenience store connected to us that serve as practically our offline touch point, allowing us also to uh, essentially address the financial inclusion issue of the countries. So it is a quite an interesting mix of large population, outside tier one city, archipelago, low financial inclusion, low credit card penetration, and you need practically a, a sort of a, quite a different strategy to, to tackle into this market compared to what you have seen uh, more commonly adopted globally kind of strategy. Yeah, and in terms of the, the customer journey, as you just mentioned, you know, the Indonesian market is quite different from other more mature markets around the world. So what does it look like when a, you know, a customer comes to your e-commerce platform, given you have this blend between offline and online? Is there kind of a dis different customer journey that one would see versus, you know, just a traditional, um, you know, cookie cutter approach, as you talked about? There's a couple quote unquote, slightly different journeys, right? I mean, obviously the cookie cutters would be, you go to the web, to the apps, you purchase something, you pay it using your credit cards and, and you know, get the logistic to, uh, 3PL to deliver the goods and they, there you are. Now, one of the challenge obviously with, without having credit cards or lower financial inclusion, what we have addressed is you can still shop on the apps. And then when you pay it, you pay it in one of the mom and pop kiosks. This mom and pop kiosks, today already have an e-wallet with us. So as a result of that, you pay this mom and pop kiosk cash and they settle your transaction using their e-wallet on your behalf. And this works not just in physical goods. Um, even recently, we got a great success in gaming product and this is game vouchers, diamonds, items. And one of the key reason is because a lot of the Indonesian can't purchase this item in apps because they don't have credit cards, right? So they have to settle that transaction using, using cash payment with the mom and pop kiosk. Now, the third journey is, is uh, where we use the mom and pop kiosk as practically an agent or intermediary to sell. So this mom and pop kiosk, because they're traditional convenience store, they source FMCG from us now in bulk purchase. So they, they, they source you know, large amount of instant noodle, coffee and all that. And then they sell it on the offline basis on their offline store to their offline customer. And also, obviously, they also help the offline customer that wants to uh, in, uh, engage into a number of financial service and virtual product. So today you go to this mom and pop traditional convenience store, not only that they, they are able to source, source their goods cheaper and faster because of on the FMCG side, a physical goods side with us, but you can also pay your electricity bill. You can send money, remittance. Um, they, they also work as uh, logistic agents for us on our behalf. You can, so you can send your goods, you can pay your uh, tax, you can pay your telephone bill, you can pay your water bill. So a whole bunch of this capability, essentially this mom and pop kiosk, once they're connected to us, they can service the end customer just like a modern convenience store, modern retailer. So we play that part of essentially upgrading their capability from traditional mom and pop traditional convenience store to be practically at the same level playing field of the modern retailer and convenience store. That's really interesting. You're almost operating as kind of an e-commerce platform 
for both offline services and online services for these smaller retailers. So you're, you're providing services that they wouldn't have access to. That's really interesting. I don't think you, you typically see that in other mature markets. So it's definitely, I think, unique to the Southeast Asia um, you know, demographic and, and population. I would admit that we didn't plan this out initially to be as such. Um, it was, as I said before, the initial idea of the, the offline mom and pop store was very simplistic. We needed to make sure that our end customer has a place to convert cash into a digital payment. Mind you, this is a, Indonesia is a country that has less than 150,000 ATMs even from the, bank, the whole banking system combined, right? It has less than 30,000 bank branch. Now, a lot of people probably see mom and pop kiosks in daily basis, there are millions of them, but fail to recognize that these are actually an asset. These are a great infrastructure for any company to tap into the structure of archipelago countries. So, you know, for decades, people has been going out there, setting up their own branch, setting up their own offline outlets. While in reality, if you can tap into this, this mom and pop kiosk, these are infrastructure already available within Indonesia for decades. And, you know, right now there are like millions and millions of them. And that's exactly where we leverage on um, by recognizing this, this one factors. It's uh, super fascinating. It's a, it, it seems to be really kind of like a win-win-win story where you're empowering the, the store and you also benefit from that and then the end customer probably also benefit. So it's kind of like a real kind of upwards trajectory in, on, on every level there. Um, how do you actually acquire these mom and pop stores? Is, do, do you have kind of a marketing strategy? Is it kind of word of mouth because I, I think you said 13.6 million or something something around that range that's that's a lot of um you know kind of i suppose customers you have or um so what was kind of the strategy there yeah so it's built over i, I call it um sweat blood and tears right um, but the beauty about um and, and we didn't realize it initially the beauty about connecting to this mom and pop kiosk is you while you need in the initial stage when you come into a new zone you do need introductory by means we use a third party um, sales force to educate and and try and obtain them and acquire them but that strategy only works for at most 10 percent of your market segment why because it's very costly the cac of doing that is about 20 bucks it's very very costly now the beauty is that they are business so the remaining of the acquisition is actually organic. That's how the blended CAC now, you know, we able to get it at about $6 CAC when in 2018, it was about $20, uh, $20 plus. What it means is that they are business. The focus is always about how can you help them make more money? So for example, this mom and pop kiosk, the moment they connected to us, because of our ability to reduce a number of middlemen, essentially, we are able to deliver the physical goods, the mineral water, the, the, the instant noodles, all the FMCG goods at a much faster rate and cheaper price. That improved their margin. And on top of that, you know, we add those capability for them to sell the virtual product financial service. They weren't able to do that before. They weren't able to, to service the end customer that wants to do remittance, that wants to pay for electricity bills. Now, every single one of those additional revenue stream essentially add them commissions and add them income. So on average, this mom and pop kiosks after they connected to us, their revenue went up two to three X. Not so much because they're selling three times more shampoo, but because they were selling shampoo and soap. Now they do that additional SKU on top of that. Plus, they're also able to provide all this financial service, um, top up e-money and all this additional new revenue stream. Now, as a result of that, this mom and pop kiosk, they are community store, right? So the moment that uh, a lot of the neighbors, a lot of their competitors start saying, hey, these guys is making two to three times more money, people start to talk. The word of mouth starting to spread. And that's why, while in 2017, 2018, the initial CAC was very high because we're able to consistently give evidence that those that connected to us are making more money we're starting to get the organic coming from the neighbors, coming from the store across the street. And because of this organic, then it's starting to, the CAC going down from $20 to now about $6.
But I always say the key of this business is not about capital because you can't do subsidy on this too much, right? I mean, you know, there's their business. You're going to have to spend a lot of money if you rely on subsidy. The key is value add. How can you help them make more revenue? How can you help them essentially make more money? That's how you stay ahead of everybody else because it's human nature always wants to make more money today than yesterday and more money tomorrow than today. So you continuously innovate on, on how to help them making more money tomorrow compared to today, essentially. Let's dive into the financial services part a little bit more. Um, so you mentioned the low credit card penetration and what that kind of, you, you said, kind of translates uh, in, into is that a lot of the end customers, even if they're on the app, they can't really pay then for the, for the goods that they might want to purchase. So I think you described them being able to you know, go to, to, to one of the convenience stores, mom and pop stores um, in your network to do that. And then you mentioned all kinds of other financial services like remittances that they can also engage with kind of tell us a little bit more. Do you, do you also have kind of a, a wallet for, for consumers? Um, I think you, you mentioned kind of e-money pop-up, like is that a big part of your business? Is it more of a kind of facilitation mechanism? Because we at ARG, we've, you know, for a couple of years looked at digital wallets and, what kind of came from China with WeChat Pay and Alipay, and there you also had this, you know, um, this. Um, yeah, m maybe I'll stop there, and I'll, I'll have more <laughs> questions maybe for, to follow up. But yes, would would love to dive more into the financial services. Yeah, so we don't own the digital payment, uh, the e-wallet. So we partners with Dana, we partners with Ofo. You can pop up practically every e-money available in Indonesia, but we have that as a service. We see financial service as practically the bloodstream that we require in order to, I guess, support the front end of every single one of our business, either that be the mom and pop kiosk, either that be the marketplace and so on. Now, however, uh, we recently, beginning of this year, we made a minority investment um, in Bank Allo, which is a digital bank. So the, the vision that we have is we want to have a solid and robust financial service through offering of the digital bank to be offered to also all the mom and pop kiosks. So not only that if we facilitate the payment, the digital payment, but we are also looking on how to help them on their working capital, for example, right? So that when they purchase bulk, uh, some of the FMCG from us, then they can repay it a few days later after that start reselling and having that proceed from the sales. Now on the overall financial service, uh, or financial inclusion, so to speak, uh, we also have um, the, the license to distribute mutual fund. So even in the e-wallet, where typically it doesn't generate any interest for those people who put the money on their wallet, they are able to shift that into the likes of mutual fund on money market and essentially getting some sort of a return. And so we package that together so that we kind of build one ecosystem with all this financial service, practical digital financial service, working on the back end as the bloodstream to support the business to grow bigger. So you're supporting more so the um you know the mom and pops wallet and you know helping on the transactional side there less so on the customer side um that's more outsourced and you're working with more third party if i understand correctly no no so on the on the overall e-wallet uh it's actually partners with a third party now uh the when i mentioned the digital bank that is a new initiative that we invested at the beginning of this year that's under integration. Um, it, the digital bank apps was just being launched literally like about a month ago. So we're still on integration, but the vision is in the future. We want to offer all the digital banking capability for our mom and pop kiosks as well. Now, in regards to when they, obviously when they sell to the end customer, today, majority of that are still taking place in cash for reasons because it's a very cash-based society. Uh, but, you know, we, we have been partnering with the central bank and rolling out the unified QR. Well, the take, take up rate is still quite low, obviously, because it's still a very high cash basis society. But we are seeing this for the next five, 10 years ahead. We do hope that the country can um, starting to have that digital financial inclusion uh, being tapped into all this outside tier one city, even to the level of the end customer, 
not just on the B2B basis. And that's super interesting because, you know, as you said, this is, it's, it's difficult to, to compare, you know, countries all across, the, all across the globe, but also kind of within Asia and Southeast Asia. But we've seen a little bit of a similar thing in China with WeChat Pay and Alipay and a lot of the kind of street merchants using the QR codes and that kind of slowly, slowly taking over over the last 10 years. Um, you know, replacing cash to a, to, a, to a significant extent. So it sounds like you're kind of putting kind of yourself into a position where you can benefit from such a change or even kind of drive it. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about kind of what is the financial services setup, like banking setup for a convenience store? Because um, even here in the U.S. or, or in other countries, um, some of these small businesses, they're often underbanked, right? And that's why also here we have Square, you know, uh, becoming a bank and Shopify offering banking services. So there seems to be this kind of global trend there um, towards banking these, these SMEs and, and all the benefits that can come from that. As the theory goes, and I said the word theory because, you know, th this is an initiative that everybody is striving for in this country, but always say, Nobody has proven it, right? So the approach we're taking is that uh, we partner with Bank Ella, with which uh, we have the minority investment there. The beauty is that um, this bank has multiple ecosystem. So it does have the offline ecosystem of Trans Retail. Trans Retail is one of the largest uh, media and retail conglomerate in this country. And then they also have ourselves as the marketplace ecosystem. And then you have the Salim Group, which is one of the largest FMCG uh, producer on, on top of various other conglomeration that they have. It also has Grab, the ride hailing uh, community, uh, ride hailing uh, services there. It has Traveloka, which is the, the online uh, travel agent. Uh, it has Caro. So this is probably one of the digital banks that we see it to have multiple ecosystem as a shareholder, as well as a partners. Now, the vision that we have is that all this ecosystem would that allow the banks to have a very good capability to score the end, their customer coming through the different part of their life. So essentially they know how they behave on the offline transaction with trans retail. They know how they behave with Bukalapa. They know, uh, they know how they behave when they're transacting with Grab and so on and so on. And by doing so, then we are hopeful that they are able to score it better when we are we are looking or the bank is looking to provide them with financing then we are hopeful that it's, it's coming through a much more accurate a much more uh, robust scoring and therefore can provide them with the right product at a, at a better rate as well now essentially that is the, the the theory that i think we are going with and that's the theory we are working on we do think that that is the winning strategy uh, but again this is the first year we start rolling it out so hopefully we, we can start to see some of the result uh, in the next year or two. Yeah, that's uh, really interesting that there's so much focus and you know so much room for growth in the financial services sector. And you're kind of acting as, you know, one piece to this larger flywheel effect of, you know, that seems to be centered around banking more and more of the population um, so that you can layer on these additional services. In terms of looking towards the future, where would you say the company is best positioned and you know what's next on the journey in terms of continuing to offer more services to both on the b2b side but also just direct to consumers what are you what are you what, what is the company looking at yeah so i think in particularly when it comes to financial service keep in mind that you know indonesia is a country that today has over 100 banks in 1998 it has over 200 banks actually right Yet, having 100 banks, and mind you, this is not the United States in, in terms of the size of economy, having 100 banks, yet at the same time, uh, financial inclusion is relatively low, which is you know, probably contrary to it, right? But it sort of suggests that different approach are needed. And this is where we, we want to play this role as, I guess, the bridge, because I think a lot of the uh, financial inclusion so far has been taken into effect by each of the bank independently or individually by themselves. 
So they are looking to roll out their own banking uh, branch. They are looking to roll out their own agency and so on. What we do, hopefully, is that we leverage on, as I said in the beginning, we leverage on the infrastructure that's already available in this country, which is essentially the R64 million MSME in this country. Leverage on them, not replacing them, but collaborate with them, have them as your Asian offline capability to start rolling out a number of service, not just a financial service, essentially in this case, but also as, as uh, we discuss about how we even help the penetration of e-commerce into the outside tier one city to enablement of conversion of cash payment to a digital payment uh, settlement by the mom and pop kiosk. So we see ourselves today as playing this role as the intermediary or the bridge, hopefully to bring this country where it is today on the financial inclusion and digital transformation to hopefully the next level. Um, our vision is that because a lot of this, this uh, individual, a lot of this MSME, their first interaction in, in digital realm, their first interaction in financial inclusion, financial service is with us. And that's as a result, as they are progressing deeper into the journey, they become a lot more loyal because we are the first touch point into this, this universe, essentially. Got it. And I'm going to just maybe ask an adjacent question here. Um, you know, looking at one of the trends we've been following in some uh, markets around the world when it comes to e-commerce is this inclusion of social media as a way to drive adoption and as a way to drive trends and these trends ultimately end up in purchases. Are you seeing that within um, the markets you're operating in as well? TikTok has become kind of a global powerhouse. We always typically point towards TikTok as being able to drive trends and drive this type of e-commerce adoption that you know, usually follows those trends. Are you seeing that same thing play out? And how are you trying to capitalize on that? So I think I'll answer that with two points. First one is we did try, we did a trial on the uh, live shopping last year. It was not very successful at all for us. Uh, but mind you, this is because 75% of our business is from outside tier one city. The internet connection is not exactly 5G, obviously in Indonesia, not all of it. Uh, I think that's one of the key reason, but we've been following TikTok very closely um, and, and it actually has been doing quite well, very well in this country. Now, I think for us, what we have done is we have been approaching a lot of our merchant and collaborate with them and, and even help them on how to uh, market their product better in, in even TikTok, right? And mind you, in TikTok, at, at least in Indonesia, I don't know if this is the same uh, elsewhere, a lot of the seller and the person you see in the TikTok is a different person, right? So the producer will actually get the influencer. Um, so we kind of get engaged into that area, helping some of the producer, help them to also select some of the uh, influencer and, and help them shape some of the messaging as well. I mean, the way we see it as always is because our focus, as you, you, know, as you see in the first uh, part of the discussion, our focus has always been on how to help the seller to kind of make more money. So to us, we are a bit more agnostic in regards of the sales channel. If we are able to help them to kind of grow that in a multiple channel, we do. And even today, for example, uh, we do have a services on, uh, we have the SaaS services, which allow them, um, our online merchant to have their own storefront. Uh, we help them, essentially, I wouldn't call it Shopify. We're still very far away, obviously, from Shopify, but same idea. We engage in the conversational commerce, um, so our focus on, is on how to help them on multi sales channel and help them to kind of grow their business because the moment they make more money, we make more money because we are getting commission based on their business uh, flow and size. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And I think the multi channel approach is the, the right one in terms of, you know, we're seeing a number of different platforms pop up and you can now sell on all of those. So having, you know, a backend service that supports multiple storefronts seems to be the right path forward, given how diverse the entertainment space has gotten in terms of, you know, the social media landscape branching out into all of these different platforms, you know, using one to just target one audience on one social media I think you'll end up losing out on a ton of business if you're not on all of the other, you know, billion plus platform in terms of users that are out there. So that makes, yeah, that's, a, that's a great, yeah, it's awesome. It makes perfect sense for us too, right? Because I think we have been avoiding a single channel strategy. And as you said, not only that you're missing out on, uh, on the opportunity, that's one, but second is to have that one channel that you own, so to speak, or you champion, 
if you want to dominate just using that one channel, it is actually very, very costly. So we have actually taken the view that we are not going to, to dominate on the general marketplace basis, but we are looking at this on multiple sales channel, looking on how to grow this mom and pop kiosk, how to grow this MSME and online seller. Because if you look back the history of Indonesia, there's always no shortage of players who wants to play the aggressive capital strategy. And that has been multiple players that's been doing that over the past decade. And we're not talking about two, three years, we are talking about the, the last 12 years, right? So it seems that there will be always somebody that will take up that post as the aggressive capital player. And therefore, you know, in our way of looking at things is let's not engage into pound by pound kind of battle because, you know, this, you need to kind of offer the value add in order to have your, your user, either that be merchant or end customer to be sticky. Makes sense. And we're seeing that play out here, I think in the US as well with Amazon now going more so the Shopify route, which is, you know, buy with Prime or sell with Prime. Um, so being able to offer sellers the ability to still use Amazon's backend infrastructure, which I think is the approach that you're taking, um, but be able to reach, you know, audiences on different platforms. Yep. No, that's that's exactly right. So, so for example, in our storefront uh, and, and conversational commerce, then they use our, our financial service, our payment, our logistic, all those capabilities that we have that is being attached and that provide as the additional value uh, add to them where we are able to monetize those part. Maybe an adjacent area here is is gaming. Is that is that part of this conversation as well? Or what, what's kind of the strategy with, with uh, gaming, as you mentioned? Yeah, so we don't actually develop our own game. Let, let, let me start by saying that, right? So our focus is marketplace for game items um, and that, you know, the voucher, diamonds and all that. And and we are, you know, now that we have been quite successful, we have been rolling this out the last 12, 18 months, the, the fully owned subsidiary is actually as a standalone now profitable and it has grown uh, triple digits magnificently in the last 18 months. Uh, we are looking into beyond just just normal gaming looking at some of the more hobby type of related product which is had which comes from similar category uh, we find gaming to be a, a very interesting segment it has good monetization it has about two to three x higher monetization on take rate compared to most of the general marketplace type of products we do have that uh, value add wherein a lot of the players, especially from outside tier one city needs to pay by cash and therefore leveraging on our offline infrastructure, we're able to offer that capability to our end customer. And that has been one of the key reason we believe, uh, the reason why that segment has been growing pretty uh, strongly for us. But yeah, it has been one of the, the strongest growth and, and a uh, great revenue contributor um, in the last, uh, the, particularly the last six to 12 months as this company has been on the stable ground and in a growth trajectory. Just curious in terms of that transaction process. So if you're someone from one of these, you know, tier three cities um, outside tier one, are you, you know, purchasing something online, walking over to the merchant store, uh, paying in cash and then receiving some type of vouch. I think you had mentioned voucher. So is it you know scannable via QR code and then that's uploaded to the game? Are these virtual items? Or are they more physical, um, you know, game items? So this is the same setup as if you buy the the voucher or the diamonds. Um, for example, I think in a developed market, you typically have um, the the gift cards um, that that has the, you know, you buy $50 worth of whatever games, Roblox, whatever it is, right? Um, that is the same structure um, that we implemented. Of course, in Indonesia, those distribution of those um, cards, the, the, those vouchers, uh, in you don't, they don't sell it in like supermarket and stuff. So the penetration is a lot lower. And that's where we tap that into the, the traditional convenience store and mom and pop kiosk to practically allow to sell that. But we use a practical a virtual voucher rather than a physical. Got it. And what have been some of the most popular games that uh, you've seen pop up in, in terms of the sales uh, uh, on your side of kind of the equation? What, what games are you seeing, um, you know, driving a lot of the traffic uh, for the, the, the vouchers and the game items? Yeah, the usual suspect are the Mobile Legends, Ragnarok, uh, uh, Free Fire. So it's, it's the common games that I think everybody knows. Um, and I think the Indonesians are just following the global trend and start playing exa exactly the same games. That, that makes sense, yes. I, I think as we kind of uh, wrap up here, um, 
be really interesting to know kind of looking into the future and you described your ambitions and the vision for the company but what are the biggest challenges or risks that 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 you face or that that you think you really have to navigate around smartly believe it or not i think you know sitting where i'm sitting the biggest challenge to me is bring the company into profitable that has been our sole focus because if you looked at this region this part of the region on the tech company everybody is still at the rent now uh we do think that in third quarter this year we should be able to bring our contribution margin to a positive territory that is revenue after cost of revenue after subsidy sales and marketing so anything before the uh the salary the head office gna essentially so that probably bring us to be one of the first if not one of the earliest um in this part of the world now having said that we still need to cover for the uh, gna so we are now getting into the the new territory in our mind uh in bringing the financials into practically a bit that positive or net income positive outside any of the mark to market and stuff because of ifrs so this is operational profitably i think is the key um and and this is a new new i guess new territory because now we are talking about how to maintain that margin and grow that revenue so that it brings it across the line um to cover for uh uh the cost of the gna cost and bring the company into profitable we do think that our cash flow uh should hopefully turn positive sometimes uh in the first half next year and i say cash flow because we do have about a billion uh, a billion and a half in cash which means that we and, and our annual burn is like about 100 million dollars um so we do have uh quite a long runway on like decade plus with the interest income and all that we do think that we should bring the cash flow to positive um sometimes in the first half next year and hopefully bring the company into a profitable company by late this uh end of uh, 2023 great that's exciting times for you ahead um on on the financial front here but also on the just just broader business front as you described um with with all that you're working on with the the merchants and 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 all the uh, services and and products that you offer. Um Teddy, thank you so much. This was super interesting. I think you know, um Nick and I definitely learned a ton. I think our listeners also learned a ton. Um so yeah, it was was great to have you and maybe down the road um be great if we can catch up and and speak again. Definitely. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Nick. Great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Arc believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that Arc believes to be reliable. However, Arc does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from Arc. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on Arc's current views and assumptions and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.